Raja Al Mazrui, welcome to the podcast. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today in the studio. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. So you are now the CEO of Etihad Credit Insurance, which is a, a, a big deal. Um, but at the same time, you've had some really critical roles at DIFC with the fintech hub and so forth. Uh, you know, as as a as a woman in a very competitive uh, sort of male dominated field, particularly finance arena, um, it's great to see you uh, taking on these leadership roles. But let me ask you, you know, what is it that you would attribute your success as being a strong leader to? You know, what what has uh, enabled you to have uh, to to differentiate yourself in this way? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, I'm really also excited about my uh, new role at Etihad Credit Insurance as the CEO. And I believe that what brought me here is my curiosity, passion for learning all the time. I'm always driven by challenge. And um, I, I, I'm very curious, so I really go after uh, everything that I don't understand, try to understand it learn from different sources. You don't have to go to university to understand all of this. And this happened to me uh, uh, greatly during the uh, setup of the uh, FinTech Hive at the DIFC, because all of these technology uh, transformations in the financial services sector were happening, were happening at a, a speed of light. Right. And we needed to understand uh, so that we can communicate, we can create awareness, and we can be part of that whole transformation. Having the passion to learn and also having the confidence to um, saying what you really think about what's happening and not fearing failure has enabled me to navigate my way uh, through this uh, journey. But also having an enabling ecosystem around mm. you supports you to take those uh, bold steps. And I have been in different roles in my life, different organizations and different management styles. And throughout, I, um, I have found the support and the comfort to actually ask questions when I don't understand and also to come up with the new non-conventional ideas to um, answer some of those questions. Mm. Well, you know, this is important because, you know, particularly in the early days of fintech, um, when was the DIFC fintech hub? started? So the DIFC FinTech Hive started, first of all, as a strategy in 2014. And we were looking right. at uh, technology uh, transforming uh, all sectors. We looked at capital markets and we saw that tech companies were dominating capital markets. And there were some financial services companies in there, some oil and gas companies in there. But we knew that that wave would hit financial services. And as the DIFC, the leading financial uh, center in the region, we needed to protect the interests of our companies who are financial services providers. And we understood that the best way to equip them and enable them to do that is by understanding what's happening in the fintech space, enable them to take part of it. And that's when we launched the fintech hive back in 2017 as an initiative to accelerate the sector through collaboration and co-creation where we brought the financial uh, services institutions on board and we said, you know what, technology is transforming all of these sectors and we believe it's coming to financial services and we would like to take you on a journey to explore the opportunities that this technology is bringing by working and collaborating with fintech startups who are looking to disrupt your business. So we created a safe environment for all of these um, challenges, opportunities, and transformations to happen within the DIFC, who was the space holder for that transformation. Amazing. Because that really was, like you mentioned 2014, you know, there's so much was happening in 2014 in terms of fintech globally. You had challenger banks like uh, Monzo and Starling, uh, you know, launch uh, in in 2014, I think Revolut as well. Um, you know, 2015, you had Kakao Bank in South Korea. You had WeBank and MyBank in China. You had NewBank in LATAM. So, it, like, those, those years were so critical. And, um, you know, so much has changed in the UAE for 
supporting startups since that period. You know, um, the uh, the regulations around having um, local Emirati uh, sponsorship of businesses has changed, the fintech charter uh, allowances that have come. And of course, we've seen the um, you know, uh, Dubai in particular become a big hub for crypto um, and Web3 uh, type companies. If you think about it, that's in less than 10 years we've had all of that activity happen. So, you know, it, it's, it's almost chaotic in terms of the frequency of change. So do you find as a leader that it's not just about having a vision and curiosity, but um, you know, to be a good leader, you, you have to lead so people can follow. So how do you instill that confidence in the team around you, especially when it's very experimental? So going back to 2014, I have to tell you that I was offered Bitcoin for $200 and I said no. Don't even tell me about <laughs> Bitcoin. That, so, yeah, I, I, I could tell you some stories. And I said no because I spoke to people around me and I was in the heart of the financial services right. community and I said guys, what do you think about this Bitcoin? I was like, what is Bitcoin? It's not regulated. It's not going to happen. It's some kids playing with some technology. Forget it. But then I started to see uh, some people start investing in crypto and they didn't understand what crypto was at that mm. point of time. It was like a, a venture that, there were, that they were venturing in. Some of them were making money, some losses, back making some returns on their investments. But I think when you come up with this challenging idea and you are okay exploring it and I believe that's what we have done we said you know we'll bring the technologies we'll bring the companies and let's see where this will take us so really venturing into that journey uh, not necessarily knowing that we will make hundreds of thousands of returns on those uh, bitcoins having uh, bought them at that time but really say finding out what is it about and when you take this step you send a message to the people around you who are looking at you and, and saying, why the DFC would be doing this? Why is Raja doing this? And I and I tell you, when I wanted to take on this role in, in fintech and I was speaking to my friends and they're like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, what is fintech? What if it's just a bubble? What if it's what if it doesn't work? You would have sacrificed your career for something that you don't know where it's going. But coming from a technology background and, and looking at what's happening in terms of trends, in terms of sectors, in terms of investments and acquisitions, it was signaling uh, constantly the same message. Mm. Technology is uh, uh, transforming all of these sectors and it's a wave and we need to ride it. But I have to say something else about 2014. 2014, the UAE government actually announced that whole innovation agenda and it was mm. a mandate on local and federal departments to start looking at the the opportunities of innovation within those uh, government within the, uh, those departments and every entity started to look internally for opportunities of innovation now some of them started to look at automation as innovation which right. is which is completely different but it gave them somewhere to start and also raise the expectation of those organizations if the government is looking at innovations and we have innovation KPIs, what are we doing as local and federal departments to be part of this journey? Um, the, the push came from the top, the support came from within the ecosystem, and then we started to see the success stories like the banks you've mentioned, like all the solutions that were uh, growing all around the world. And we knew that the Middle East has a huge opportunity mm. and we have the talent, we have the uh, business opportunities, we have the investments. We just need to curate a journey for all of them to come together so that mm. they benefit from it. So it's it's not only the curiosity and vision, as you said, but also the determination to go through the experience and finding out on your own what is it going uh, to take you. Now, we had certain expectations, but we kept the pulse with the market. 
We traveled around the world. We looked at other accelerators. We formed a global uh, network of uh, fintech just to learn from each other, uh, to understand what challenges are happening in uh, other hubs. How can we get our startups to be part of that? And also internally, we formed um, uh, a group with our financial institutions. We've identified their challenges, their priorities, and started to publicize those challenges and scout startups from all over the world. And we said, you know what, you don't have to be based here. You can come from anywhere in the world. You should have at least an MVP, at least one customer on your system to show us how it's done. And then we started that whole progressive innovation uh, journey with our financial institutions. And I believe the role the IFC played in terms of leading this whole uh, sector or industry initiative has brought in a lot of trust into it because the DIFC represents the government. Right. We had the regulators from the DIFC part of this. We had the financial institutions agreeing to be together in, uh -huh. in one yep. place, looking at uh, opportunities and challenges together and prioritizing what is relevant to them and working with the same group of startups to curate their own solutions was constantly uh, signaling the market that we were doing what we need to do in this part of the world to enable innovation. Now, when you talk about innovation, one of those classic challenges that you have to get over is um, is definitely the fact that uh, many people can't extrapolate, you know. And so when you look at something like Bitcoin or crypto or fintech, people really can't sort of see this change occurring. Um, but, it, you know, if you look at leadership qualities, the ability to extrapolate, the ability to project where things could go, particularly in highly innovative areas, is, is a really crit critical skill. So how do you keep on top of the technology trends and, you know, the, the, uh, those leading indicators of, of change? So uh, throughout the ecosystem that we have created, we're working with many different stakeholders. And we as the FinTech Hive, were commissioning a report every year to look at top trends in FinTech, what's happening globally, who's investing what in what technology. And we started to see some commonalities that mm. were giving us directions toward what uh, are the technologies that are going to be the priority for that time. So, for example, we started with the blockchain. In 2017, everybody was talking about the blockchain. 2018, we started to talk about KYC and AML and how could these technologies enable the banks to relieve their uh, hard work that they put on those functions, leveraging technologies, integrating to data sources. Then uh, we started to look at open banking. Then the pandemic happened and no one had choice but to get onto mm. that technology wave to enable access to services from anywhere in the world. And during that time, we saw a lot of people, because of the lockdown and the uncertainty, uh, looking at uh, different solutions like wealth management, uh, robo-advisory, and um, you know uh, online trading. Because initially, we couldn't invest in uh, uh, international markets without having a private bank represent you. But then all these small players came in and say, mm. you know what, just open an account, $500, you can right. start trading uh, stocks in the US. And everyone had the time they needed to understand what was going on. And the pandemic, as, as bad as it was, it really accelerated that journey. It changed the mindset of individuals. And at that time, speaking back about uh, the UAE, the government services were all online. You could renew your rent, you could pay your dues without leaving the house, doing all of your financial transactions. But as leaders of those institutions, that importance or focus on technology was very clear. Everyone was transforming and that direction towards technology, innovation and fintech specifically um, is supported by all the figures and numbers and proof of concepts that were happening during that time has actually shifted the financial institutions focus to technology, not only an enabler, but only a, a tool towards unlocking new opportunities. Now, the pandemic was one of these things that really sort of proved, was a proof point for all of that work. Jamie Dimon, you know, famously said uh, that um, 10 years of investment 
in uh, innovation paid off in a single year during the pandemic for, for JP Morgan Chase. And I think a lot of us who've been embedded in the fintech space and, and battling against those very traditional views of finance and so forth, we were like when the pandemic hit, we were like, see, See, you know, um, but a lot of the groundwork, as you said, had been done. Uh, the Emirates, uh, uh, you know, UAE had the Emirates ID program. We had the e-government uh, program and so forth that had already, a lot of that foundational work had been done. When a- actually when you look at it, it's fairly exceptional. The United States is not there. I mean, we don't even have real-time payments in the US yet. You know, it's coming. Um, but part of that is also a culture of innovation in the society. But um, presumably you've grown up in um, the Emirates. So um, is there any moments that you can sort of reflect on historically, I- even before DIFC, where um, people were given the permission to be more innovative in the culture locally? Absolutely. I remember in one of the uh, government summits that we hold in the UAE on an annual basis where governments from all over the world come together to discuss trends and, you know, opportunities and challenges. Our current president, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed uh, Al Nahyan, Uh, made a speech and he said, in uh, 2050, we will export the last barrel of oil of the UAE. You need to think what we will be doing then, what we will be doing now to enable a diversified economy away from oil exports. And, And that resonated with me and with everyone in the room and everyone in the UAE that this government is determined on diversifying its economy towards knowledge-based economy, towards innovative uh, opportunities to enable contribution to the economy and the GDP away from oil. So I think this um, this statement really resonated with me and with so many others that, yes, we are blessed with, uh, with this country and this government and the funding we have access to, but what are we going to do for our children? What are we going to do post-2050? Yeah. Now... You know, if we look at 2050 as a target, you know, undoubtedly the world's going to be very different. You know, we're talking a lot about artificial intelligence, high levels of automation, the term smart economies for 2050, you know, how economies will operate. Um, This is all, I I think, you know, if if you look forward to this over the next 20 to 30 years, there's going to be a, a lot of changes but the way economies work together, the way businesses function and, and sort of pull together, we're really now, you know, sort of trying to take a lot of the friction out of the system, the use of paperwork, uh, um, you know, databases that don't talk to each other and, and so forth. That's a lot of very hard work. So, you know, it seems like almost too big of a problem to fix in many ways. But now as your role of a CEO, being involved in trade finance and so forth, how do you look at that problem in terms of the, the platform of doing business and trying to introduce that level of automation? So I think uh, the experience with the DIFC Fintech Hive has opened my mind towards the unlimited opportunities to really bring economies together. I know I worked on a ecosystem for fintech in the UAE, which brought banks together with the startups, with um, the rest of the ecosystem to enable and activate the sector. But where I sit today at uh, at Etihad Credit Insurance, I see the global opportunity of bringing a global ecosystem together that speaks the same language, that has the same standards, that understands the same Mm. terms and terminology to facilitate trade during the pandemic, trade was the mostly hit sector because of restrictions of movement. Right. And if we had those digital channels, smart contracts, uh, swift payments, we would not have been disrupted because these ports would have continued to work and these transactions would have happened and all the letters of credit would have been paid on time based on action. So technology is there right now. And I know there's a lot of people that talk about future and futuristic trends and about AI and metaverse, ignoring that building blocks are missing right now. 
and we can talk as much as we want, but if we don't have the support and buy-in and engagement of the people on the ground who does the day-to-day uh, processes, we won't be able to achieve that. And this is what I'm trying to push uh, through ECI by adopting a digital and innovative mindset and understanding how this integration and utilization of d- digital technologies will enable us to play on a global uh, scale. And I've had this conversation with uh, other ECAs around the world, and we all have the same challenge, and we're all learning from each other. And I believe we need to take this initiative, somebody to stand up and say, how about we experiment? Yes, it's a bigger ecosystem. Yes, it's different governments, different financial institutions. But there's nothing that's stopping us from trying. And this is what I will be pushing for uh, over the next couple of years to see how can we experiment with a couple of ECAs to facilitate digital trade. And what's the ECA? It's export credit uh, agencies. Okay. Just for the listeners to yeah, to so, get that. so we will experiment with a few of them. And I am sure the day we are able to achieve that, we'll be able to get more on board and create that unified platform for global uh, trade to flow. Well, there's a lot of debate about regulation around artificial intelligence right now for, for good reason. Um, but if we look at uh, data privacy... Um, you know, the uh, GDPR out of uh, uh, the European Union has become a, a, a global standard. But it seems like what you're saying is that the level of automation that we can expect in the 2040s and 2050s really does require a sort of global consensus in terms of standards. Is that correct? Absolutely. And uh, for a period of time in my life, I was the commissioner of data protection at the DIFC. And the DIFC was always pushing for the data protection regime. And we're doing the audits to make sure that the data is uh, regulated in terms of hosting and sharing and so forth. And with the pandemic, we keep on going uh, back to it. Everything has moved to the cloud. Where is the cloud? Who controls the cloud? Who has access to the cloud? How is the cloud using this data? Uh, Is it protected? Is it safe? Because it's all about cyber now. And and that standard, the GDPR, if not globalized, will have to be able to communicate with other standards. But we need to minimize the number of standards to facilitate Mm. that conversation. That seems fairly obvious, right? Um, I know there's a lot of debate around data residency, you know, for the cloud is that, you know, for, uh, particularly in financial services, the PII, uh, you know, personal identi- ad- identifying information, um, you know, that this needs to be only stored in, in the geography of residency. Um, and yet, if you look at it, um, you know, geographical boundaries for things like data centers don't really make a lot of sense in the world that we're moving to. And AI, we're not going to have homegrown AI necessarily, you know, that like you're not going to have UAE-grown AI necessarily that's going to dominate on a global basis. It would seem like China and uh, the US have a fair shot at creating AIs that are more broadly used. But so by nature of that, you're going to have very distributed systems. Now, blockchain was one of the technologies you talked about early on. Um, how important has that become in, in um, the UAE in terms of the ecosystem? It's very important because um, really to process this data, you need to know where is it hosted and what regulation does it fall under. And this was one of the biggest challenges for fintechs because if you're a fintech from the US and you want to work in the UAE, you needed to bring in your technology somehow here because you're working with very sensitive data that can't be shared. And then you go back to the traditional way of setting up businesses. So you're a fintech in the U.S., you need the license in the UAE and a license in Bahrain to just be able to deal with the data flow and transactions. And I think that's a huge opportunity for the world to explore. What are the boundaries? Are they geographic? Are they regulated? Are they you know, cyber. Uh, There's a lot of work that needs to be done on that, given also the evolution of all the new technologies. Uh, There was a huge focus on the metaverse last year, and then all the data and interaction and ethics were discussed about, about the metaverse and who owns what and where does it sit. So 
do we really need those barriers or are we able to create some uh, global standards to enable that? I think it's one of the most difficult questions and I think it could slow down innovation, but it could also accelerate it if answered. Well, let's take a, a quick break. But after the break, I want to get into how regulation might change to be more sort of regionally focused rather than having very localised regulation. You're listening to the podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Raja, um, when we look at the changes that have been uh, taking place in uh, the UAE, you know, and and particularly in this very dynamic environment, I, you know, what does it take to be a successful woman a leader in in this culture that's very um, rapidly changing? You know, what sort of leadership style have you developed over the last uh, decade or so that's enabled you now to operate at this very senior level of uh, you know Emirati business? It's a very difficult question to just describe my leadership style, but I am very uh, true to myself and true to my values, and I'm very straightforward as a person. If there's something I don't understand, I ask. If there is a challenge, I ask why not or why so. And, um, you know, I'm very inclusive in my communication, in my plans, and what I'm trying to achieve. So I communicate as much as possible, and I understand that different stakeholders have different understanding, different positioning. So I always make sure that when I speak to someone, I understand where they're sitting and how they're looking at the project or initiative that I'm working on, and I understand what's in it for them to support me. And I always try to make sure that they understand that because it's a collective effort that brings those initiatives to success. And if you are not able to translate those to the stakeholders that will help you make it or they could stop you from achieving your targets, then you won't be able to progress. And it's really hand-holding along the way, hand-holding whether it's the team that's working on it, whether it's the audience, whether it's the, the decision makers. And you should always be ready with a justification. If you think this way versus this way, have a solid reason why. And, and once you, the papers are on the table, you know, you've done your part and you just you know, uh, give it your all. And if you don't believe in yourself, nobody will believe in you. So for mm. me, it's always about, am I 100% convinced with what I am doing? And if I'm convinced, then I take it forward. And what about team building? Because, you know, uh, leadership uh, is is one thing, but building the right team, you know, both, you know, as a, as a leader to fill in your, um, your perceived deficiencies or where you've got weaknesses, um, at the same time building people that buy into the vision. How do you go about sort of putting that team together? Is it quite deliberate or is it just sort of uh, more organic? So in some cases, you know, I was um, uh, fortunate to be able to build my own team from scratch. So at that time you understand what are the functions you need, what type of skills you need, and then you interview and, and choose the, the right fit for the roles, and, and that worked perfectly. But in other circumstances, you actually inherit certain teams and you want to give them the benefit of the doubt for as long as possible, bring them up to speed with your vision, communicate to them your priorities, make sure they understand why you're doing this, Get them like on board. the why is really, really important. And work as hard and uh, as much as possible to get them on board, as you said. Um, there are opportunities of upskilling, reskilling, moving resources around to make sure that they buy into what you are doing and they support you because this is a collective effort again. But then if it's not working, it's time to take the difficult decisions and say, listen, we've tried, it's not working, let's move on. Let but me find you a job outside of the organization. <laughs> sometimes it's like that. Yeah. But that's yeah. that's the reality and, and we shouldn't shy away from it because, um, uh, you know, certain cultures does not uh, fit everywhere. Yeah. Now, you know, there there is a steep learning curve in the areas that you're working in, you know, in, in levels of automation, um, you know, supply chain automation, the B2B integration stuff, the platform approach. But... Also in fintech, you know, it's, it's, I mean, just in the last 10 years, so much has changed and there's so much uh, dynamic there. 
Um, so you have to be fairly technically skilled to be able to have the right dialogue with your team, especially if there's technologists in your team. So, um, you know, are you, is technology in this innovation area something that you are naturally inspired by and interested in, or is that something you've had to educate yourself with? No, I actually come from a technology background. I was right. a programmer. And oh, I really? Studied, you were a coder? Yes, I am What did a you coder. code in? Uh, COBOL, C++, Cobol. ASP. Wow. Don't expose me. No, no, all, <laughs> but the, all are, the COBOL <laughs> programmers are like dying at the moment. So that's a <laughs> unique for skill. Me. <laughs> so, um, and I, uh, and I come from this technology background and, and I think that's the, one of the, uh, most important skills that right. I have taken, because if you understand how technology work and how systems work, my kids are so lucky. They drag and drop and the I website know. is up and running. And I was like, I used to write code and I debug the code and right, I, right, it takes right, me right. days to get one line up. So technology has advanced so much and it's so easy to use. But when you understand the structural thinking uh, behind how those programs are done, you are actually able to understand business processes and, um, right. you know, integration of cross functions. And, and that gave me the edge in fintech. But there were a lot of technologies that I didn't understand and I took time and I sat down with the startups to understand the technology. So I understood the blockchain from one of the startups who were working on the KYC. It's called Norblock, and they're working with most of the financial institutions in the UAE. I sat down with a co-founder one day in the fintech hive and I said, could you please explain this blockchain for me? Because mm -hmm. I, I sort of understand, but not understand. And I really like to know exactly what I'm working with. I spent time with him. He explained it to me. And I did the same with every new technology that was coming, whether it's a new technology in terms of tech or it's a new product that I don't understand. But really spending those 20, 30 minutes um, with those experts will give you a lot of insight. Now with uh, Tahad Credit Insurance, I'm becoming an underwriter because I'm spending right. so much time understanding the process. And that area is undergoing a huge change, right? Because we're going from these very statistical models to now more of a real-time approach to underwriting. And, and guess what? These exporters want to buy now and pay later. Right. And we have to accommodate for yes. their requests, not only for the uh, normal consumer who buys something on his credit card. Now this is going a much bigger scale. Mm. Well, that whole area, letters of credit and um, and so forth, it, it, it you know, as we shift to sort of this real-time view of business, all of that's going to have to change, as you say, the smart contract uh, arena and so forth. Let's come back to that earlier point about the regulation. Um, you know, when we start building more cross-border automation for trade, um, we see some innovation happening there, you know, China with the uh, central bank digital currency, the UAE and Saudi are both working on um, a digital currencies now because you really need programmable money to be able to do smart contracts. But then if you're, you know, if the primary um, need for wholesale CBDCs is cross-border trade, you need to have consensus when it comes to standards and, and regulations. So where do you see that going over the next 20 or 30 years in terms of regulation for trade, regulation for cross-border uh, finance and banking? Does sort of the geographical constraints that we have today that you need to be a, a financial institution regulated in the UAE and regulated in Bahrain and regulated in the United States, as you said before, does that make sense in 20 or 30 years or is it going to be more of a regional approach? I think it will be regional because it doesn't make sense. And we've realized that, um, you know, uh, what I have seen personally with the startups, they go through uh, different regulations. And when they come, for example, when they come to the UAE, they start sharing their experience with the other regulators. So also the regulators open their mind for different ways of doing it. And I know that there are some regulatory groups where different countries come together and start mm. um, testing in a sandbox the regulation to look at the cross-border uh, transactions. So uh, the regulators are aware of this need and they are working on it. And I believe all central banks are working on their version of CBDCs that they will come to a consensus at some point of time um, sooner than later to say, 
this is how we will do it because everybody is doing it independently. And, and, and as we have the existing um, financial systems, we will have the digital financial systems that will be supported by the ecosystem players. So with FinTech Hive and, uh, you know, the work you did sort of there establishing, you know, a world-class FinTech hub, um, you you did do visits. I, I'm guessing you probably went to uh, the UK and met with Innovate Finance and because those guys were around early. Um, you know, we have obviously MAS. Uh, you know, we hope to get Sapendu Mahanti on this uh, conference series sometime in the future. Um, you know, they were quite good at setting some of those standards. But increasingly, it's it's all, almost about network of the regulators coming together and having those communications. And that's something fairly new as a trend that, that, that technology is enabled, right? That's right. And I believe um, uh, our um, the regulator and the IFC, DFSA, were part of a network called GFIN, right. which is the Global FinTech uh, regulators network and I know that they were there with Singapore with the UK and some other uh, governments and they were exploring the co-creation of regulations mm. and what applies where and how so uh, and Supendo has been um, you know uh, an advocate for the whole sector and Singapore in particular yeah. was pushing towards innovation and that's why we see a lot of startups came from there and you know, the rest of the world followed because, you know, as, as long as you have an, a room for progressive regulation, you're able to innovate. They need to just keep an eye to make sure that all the transactions are going through the technology as the way you've described it and that they have the opportunity to revert, fix if there's anything. And we've seen that in uh, DIFC with the uh, with the regulators where they put them in the sandbox, monitor them, and then after a year allow them to grow and yes. remove all the limits. Now, the sandbox approach has is, is been one of those things. If you want innovative regulation, that's uh, a key way to test and try things, which again is a new skill for regulators because experimentation has not been in their toolbox historically, no. right? Um, so that's that's been a, a big change. You know, looking looking out over the the next few years, you know, we have um, a number of technologies that are. Uh, gaining traction right now. We just saw Vision Pro announced by Apple, um, which in terms of the whole augmented reality play, as a technologist, you would understand that computers get um, more powerful, but also easier to operate. So wearable computing would seem like a, 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 you know, a very straightforward direction for computing to take. You know, if you think back to the time when we were learning to code, because I started as a coder as well, I actually learned at high school to code using punch cards. That's 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 the I system. I didn't do that, luckily. But then, <laughs> um, but then uh, quickly was on to BBC microcomputers and things like this. this is in the mid eighties. Um, and so, you know, if you think back, you know, in those old days, you required a great deal of technical skill just to be able to operate a computer. Yeah. Now, as you said, the kids can multi-touch and, you know, we've got gesture based and, and, and so forth now. Um, and at and the same time, we have artificial intelligence coming in. So um, what excites you um, and what concerns you about these technological changes that are going to be thrust on society over the next few decades? So I'm really excited about the opportunities that technology brings to the world and the way it transforms our lives. And, you know, it gives us access to resources that we've never thought we've ha we will have access to. But I'm really concerned about, um, you know, where where is the gray line in those technologies? Everybody's using chat GBT now. Some people trust it blindly. This is a machine learning uh, kind of technology. Whatever input you put into this system, it will use it to right. generate those answers. Garbage Does in, that garbage mean yeah. that what you're putting in is right? No. So you cannot just trust the technology with whatever answer is coming out of it. You need to still have that judgment. That's why we're the human. And that's the artificial intelligence. So the judgment really and the power lies with the with the human. And we really need to uh, make sure that all of these technologies are inclusive and have, um, you know, are ethical and uh, it does not discriminate um, uh 
over the data that it collects yes. over the years. The opportunities to create is, is massive. And I think that has already disrupted the content creators, the designers, because you have all of these tools now to create your PowerPoint presentations and content, and it's, it's, it's just beautiful. So you don't need the designers, the content creators, but you need the more sophisticated level of the designers and the content creators that will review what's generated by the machine, add their intelligence and their view and make it more uh, related to the type of business that you do. I'm really excited about this, but I'm so really So you are concerned. an optimist. I am, but, there, but they need measured. a bit of regulation. The way we have financial regulation, we will need technology regulation somehow. Well, this is it, isn't it? I mean, a lot of people, I think, miss that, the fact that uh, you know, you can have regulation of AI in financial services, but what about medicine? What about transportation? Um, you know, all of these other areas are going to need uh, um, increased regulation as well. So you talk about ethics. Um, you know, we, uh, you, you, we're in a society here where ethics are a strong part of the society with, with Sharia and, um, you know, and so forth uh, built into the ecosystem, which the West hasn't had to sort of incorporate. So what lessons can we learn in terms of getting consensus when it comes to ethics so that we don't have problems with uh, bias and um, gender inequality and things like that creeping into the algorithms? I think we should train the machine in a very balanced way to be inclusive because if I am uh, feeding the machine information about financial services that are general, I should also incorporate the Sharia uh, type of uh, information so that when the machine is generating all of these answers, it's actually aware. Now, it's not only in financial services, but then when you look at the metaverse and the evolution of the metaverse and all of the content and designs that were going into the metaverse, it was specific to a certain group of uh, demographics that were the innovators and creators of the metaverse. It was not including other uh, ethnic groups or right. other uh, uh, religious... Uh, uh, Persuasions. Uh, yeah. So, so I think it's at the time of creation, we need to just make sure that everyone is present. But that requires some form of consensus. So how, how do you build consensus when it comes to things like ethics across society? So I believe if we look at technology regulation as a, as a tool to drive that consensus, the regulators that would say chat GBT verified, for example, will make sure that this machine has learned from all sorts of data sources from all around the world, from all ethnic groups, from all religions to make sure that the output that comes in is not biased and also it does not drive the output towards a certain agenda. Well, that's the challenge, isn't it? Because the technology um, obviously has the opportunity to bring us together to solve some of these problems. But how do you, how, how does the technology get past some of those sort of divisions? I think the technology provides the platform, but if we can't get that consensus because we come from completely opposite schools of thought, we won't be able to get it on the technology. And right. I think those frameworks needs to be laid out with pros and cons and what does it bring. And then if we all agree, we will get to that consensus. The machine will never right. take us to that consensus. So that, that would appear like a very important leadership skill for the 21st century consensus building. Absolutely. I agree with you. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, I'm interested in your background as a technologist, but uh, I want to um, take us a little bit further out as we bring the discussion to a close. Um, it, you know, at the end of your career, in, in, in 15, 20 years, inshallah, you know, when you're looking back, um, what will you have hoped to achieve? I would have to, I would love to look back and see some impact that I have driven into this world in a positive way. Uh, be it um, an ecosystem that I have created, be it um, a book that I have published, be it a movement that I have started, or be it, um, you know, enabling certain agenda that is close to my heart to progress as we uh, briefly mentioned, um, women in tech is a very big um, uh, point. I am an advocate for having more women in tech. 
And just because I have been through the experience mm. and I understand the opportunity for women to take role in, in this particular sector and with the pandemic, with access to technology, with uh, computers becoming, um, you know, very accessible to everyone, it really enables anybody to take part of right. this economic, uh, digital economy. And by making sure that women know that there are others that have made it, there is an opportunity for you to experiment. It's okay to fail, but you have to uh, take the necessary steps in terms of learning, networking, connecting, and taking initiatives, you'll be able to blend into the sector. Don't be scared that it's male-dominated. It's male-dominated because we were busy doing other things, but now <laughs> we have access to technology and we can drive that impact. So I would love to see more women in tech, more women in fintech, more women in trade and in economic conversations. Well, I know you've covered uh, of this um, partially already, but... Um, you know, if you're speaking to the female founders out there, um, you know, these uh, up and coming female leaders, what advice would you give them seeing as you've been obviously very successful at, as, a, as a leader? I would say ask and you shall be given. Once you have an ambition and um, you have an idea and you have tested it and you believe in it, take it forward, raise funding, don't shy away from asking for money. The female founded businesses perform really well and compared to uh, all yeah, other businesses. Yeah, yeah, uh, there are results. There are venture capital companies that invest only in female uh, co-founded businesses. There is a huge ecosystem to enable more uh, women uh, entrepreneurs. Tap into that opportunity. Connect and get what you want because... Women are very uh, focused on details. And I'm sure if a woman comes and pitch a technology to me, she would understand exactly what this tech does. So I would have more um, uh, confidence in the viability of the solution compared to exactly the same pitch from someone else. So take your chances. Don't take no for an answer. Knock one door, knock a hundred. One will open for sure. So take me, you know, we talked earlier about uh, um, 2050 and the vision when the last barrel of oil ships for the UAE. What do you think the UAE will be like in 2050? What do you think the region will be like? I believe the UAE will be um, uh, highly digitized and uh, full of talent because the UAE did not only focus on building infrastructure, it's building a community, tolerant environment for people to come in and live together in peace in this country. And there are more than 200 nationalities living here for the sake of having a peaceful life, contributing to their um, uh, growth and contributing to this economy. And I believe it will be the hub for the whole region in terms of access to business opportunities, access to digital tools, digital talents, we will be in a completely digital world and we will find the regulations, we will find the investments, we will find the talent and we will find the opportunities in the UAE. Well, that's a really positive note to, to finish on. You know, the progress that has been made since I was a resident here 2005 to 2009, just the progress that's been made in terms of visas and uh, business operations, starting a business and so forth, it, it's significant progress. So if we keep on this rate of progress, then Dubai and the UAE generally is definitely going to be a global leader in this space. We so, can't wait for you to move back here. Uh, well, I'm definitely thinking <laughs> about it. Um, uh, but, you know, one one thing is, you know, we are entering the summer period in the UAE. Uh, you know, it does get very hot here, even up to 50 degrees Celsius. It's been 40, uh, you know, over the last uh, couple of days, sort of in the hun uh, low hundreds for, for those Fahrenheit listeners listening to us. But um, how do you think... The, the UAE um, and Dubai is going to engineer itself given the potential for global warming? Well, uh, the UAE takes, um, you know, uh, sustainability and climate change at the top of its priority. And as you know, we are hosting the COP28 uh, Correct, meeting yeah. here in the UAE and we are gathering 
the experts and the advocates from all over the world to come here to discuss this important topic, to learn from each other and to to, uh, build a path for a greener future for everybody. And I believe that this gathering will bring in a lot of minds together that we will be able to benefit from their experience and views and we will experiment. And hopefully we will find uh, the tools that we require to create a more sustainable future for our country. Fantastic. Well, Raja al Mazruri, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today. It's been inspirational. And, um, you know, as a female leader, I celebrate your success. And as a technologist, I, I find the way you think uh, enchanting. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure.